Hello and welcome to Dinis Guarda, Cities ABC and Open Business Council series. We are a fast-growing YouTube and podcast thought leadership channel focused on profiling the global leading inspiring people, CEOs, authors, technologists, academics, and people that are framing and creating a new vision for our world, especially looking at solutions how we can actually get better results for the problems that we are facing. In this channel, we've been actually highlighting ideas, products, inventions, software, books and solutions to the multiple challenges and opportunities we face in our cities and our society. But we face specially and we actually profile special people. People that are inspiring, people that are doing fantastic projects and people that are trying to transform our world with all the areas and all the challenge from fourth industrial revolution to blockchain, AI, and all the frontier tech technologies that are disrupting and as well accelerating our evolution as humanity. This podcast series are produced and distributed on citiesabc.com and openbusinesscouncil.org and syndicated on intelligenthq.com, fashionabc.org, edgefink.com and tradersdna.com, our associate partners and as well media platforms. So uh, today I have someone with me that I'm, uh, well, a huge fan, let's start by that, but as well someone that has been changing the way the tech landscape works in the UK and worldwide, and as well someone that has been a lot of ads, and has been having a lot of ads uh, from technology to a serial entrepreneur, but as well someone that has been looking at the way governments look at technology and the way we look at startups, the ecosystems, communities, and super growth. So I welcome Eric van der Cleve to our series. Uh, it's a pleasure to have him here uh, on a second level, but this one directly with me, and I'm looking forward to start this. So welcome, Thank Eric. you, Dinesh. Honestly, you, you should be my agent. You always give me a better introduction than I, anyone else. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, well, uh, it's all, I think, uh, <laughs> it don't need uh, a lot of words to describe your work and especially your achievements, but it's quite impressive. So I want to start um, with, uh, I think, your background. I think you have a very particular background and education. And um, how do you start your career? I, I would like to start that. Before the career, yeah. how did you start? Yeah, no, I mean, the, um, the, the, the background is, for me, quite important because it's incredibly, to be honest, very humble in that uh, I was not someone who had the benefit of a formal university education. In fact, my brother, older brother, bless him, taught me everything that I know about electronics. You know, um, he used to allow me to desolder his old circuit boards And as I desoldered a component, it explained, this is a resistor, this is the color coding, here's the chart. He would teach me about, um, you know, all the electronics and what each component did. And then instead of taking them apart, I put them together. And then one day he gave me his old Sinclair ZX81. Oh, my word, did my life change. It was amazing. It really was a privilege, actually, to, to have that machine. And I really did feel I could control the universe. It was like a gateway to an amazing uh, thing. It does show how old I am though, doesn't it? That I mentioned the Sinclair ZX81 as one of the first uh, computers I played with. It had a little tape recorder on the side. You know, you would tape your pro, you would put all your code into memory and then tape it, put it onto the tape and then reload it from a cassette tape. It was a wonderful product. Um, but it did open my mind to the possibility of technology. Um, and then I uh, really continued where, with the learning of technology through copiers, fax machines, and started to build software for uh, companies in the days that 4GLs were a big thing, you know, uh, fourth generation programming languages, using products from Borland and those famous companies and Novell, remember Novell Networks? Wow, wow amazing brands, right? Where are they now? Um, so... That evolution then brought me through to the point where I actually started my own company uh, with a co-founder, which was, I don't know if you, you know this, but I invented web callback. You know that thing where you type your phone number on a website and you press a button and it connects you with the seller. So I invented that. And I thought it was going to change the world because nobody would want to put credit cards on the internet, right? It was a crazy idea. Nobody trusted the internet. It would steal all your details. And I thought that... Um, you know, web callback was going to be the business to be in. 
So I invented that, raised some venture capital, my first uh, seed funding in London, uh, and raised various rounds of angel investment and venture capital to build the business, but it wasn't successful. And we had to do a real, my first pivot, you know, one foot in the technology, and then trying to find another application, a real technology pivot. And um, what happened was that I received a phone call from my credit card company asking me, is it really you, you know, doing this transaction? And I realized, ah, okay, so they must have thousands of these potentially fraudulent transactions. They don't know which ones are real. And they've got all these fraud agents. And I was asking this poor uh, lady who called me, so what system are you using? Tell me what tells you that it's a, uh, yeah, what is the, and she said, look, I'm sorry, I can't keep talking to you, you know. So we figured out that like, we could pivot the technology to be an automated fraud prevention system by dialing you or sending you a message to say, is this transaction really you? So if you've ever got a phone call from uh, one of those companies, it's most likely to have gone through my platform. So we restarted the company, did a pivot, it was called Adeptra, and eventually sold Adeptra um, in 2012 to FICO, a big American company, where it was one of our partners, uh, in what my wife likes to call my 10-year overnight success. So you have a name that is very Dutch, but I know that you have a well South African base and you're completely in the UK, you've been changed in the UK tech and business ecosystem. So can you tell a bit about that? I would like to touch that. Yes, my cultural background is, uh, is very diverse. I have a Iranian mother and a Dutch father. Uh, so uh, the combination of the two are quite interesting. And so our house was full of uh, music and sounds and the smell of amazing cooking. And I was raised English speaking in South Africa until I was 14 and then brought to the UK where I finished my education. Um, and so the, um, the, but the cultural backgrounds, I mean, I still have a Dutch passport. I hang on to that one. Um, although I could become a British citizen now, um, but the, it, it's interesting, you know, we're, we're in an interesting state of flux with Brexit. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, but no, the, the, the cultural diversity, I think, was the, the magic of my upbringing in that it gave me the most wonderful appreciation for all kinds of cultures, creeds, religions, societies. And that's probably one of the things that I found the most interesting are some of the most incredible people and cultures that you can meet when you're doing uh, work of the kind that you and I do. Yeah, and I think that is uh, that shows as well why part of your success as well, your capacity to put people together to create amazing projects and take it forward, and as well to deal with very complex projects. So uh, you mentioned about Adeptra, and I would like just to start that because it was your first big um, um, tech work, yeah. and as well you sold it to, like you mentioned, to... And it was Fico. listed in, in, in Isofico. So can you tell us about that? Because I know that uh, sometimes when people look at this, they look at just the, the success of this. But it was quite a, from what I understood from the previous interviews, it was quite a painful and difficult journey. And I think oh, it taught you so some, some lessons, no? Yeah, I would like to So traumatic. That. And it's, it's very interesting. That experience is what made me want to dedicate the rest of my life to supporting entrepreneurs because firstly, because entrepreneurs are the future. And secondly, because it's very difficult to do. So my own experience of this is after having raised various uh, friends and family investment and seed invested and putting my own money into the company and actually borrowing on every credit card up to the hilt to fund that business, just to the point of getting its first revenues uh, or, even angel, or, or even venture capital investment and then first revenues. That whole experience was very tough. Um, I, th I remember handing back the keys for my house when my wife was pregnant with my third daughter. It was a very tough lesson to do. We lost the house because of it. Um, and these are, the, the, these are the parts of stories of entrepreneurs that people don't often discuss. Uh, but it's, I think, the, the authenticity and the, the, the harsh reality of life as an entrepreneur made me help understand better the kind of environment that entrepreneurs need to survive and then thrive. And also it helped feed into my later work for Her Majesty's government around the pot feeding into policy because I had this direct experience of entrepreneurship. 
Of course, it all ended very well. And in the end, we sold the company for over 100 million, which was fantastic. But I won't say it was without its difficulties. It was the most challenging time that I've ever experienced in my life. And um, I'm blessed that we managed to get through it. Yeah, and that, that, that I think it's the most important thing because when we talk about business, we tend to talk about the achievements, talk about all the different things. I think that's partly why um, you are so successful as well is that you have that experience that you forge it on your own path, but as well what you've been doing in terms of uh, all the amazing work in the UK government and different things. So I want to talk precisely about, so you work for the Department of International Trade where you led the strategy for, and you became the first CEO of the UK uh, government tech city investment organization, now technation.io, tasked by the prime minister number 10 Downing Street with boosting investment and all these different things, initially a silicon roundabout. So now is historical, <laughs> but this was only nine years ago uh, or probably less, yeah. I don't know. 10 so, years, uh, no, it was the uh, tech city was, had its 10 year anniversary exactly. uh, on the 10th of November, uh, just passed last month, yeah. So, wow. But before that, before the tech city, tech nation work, um, when I exited my company, I did a part-time consulting role for the UK Trade and Investment, uh, which then is now then be called, became uh, Department for International Trade, DIT. So there, what I did was helped to pioneer a inward investment talent program so this was a program which the UK government launched to find um, entrepreneurs of exceptional potential and attract them to the UK and then help them with a soft landing and the connection to all the best networks that they can in the UK so that they grow their businesses here, employ people here and contribute to the tech ecosystem. And so that was my first experience of working with government a little bit. And it was wonderful working with that team. Uh, in fact, the, the program is called the Global Entrepreneur Program, the GEP. It's still running. It's going from strength to strength. And they have helped literally hundreds of companies set up in the UK, enhancing the entrepreneurial talent pool of the UK. And uh, the number of jobs and investments that those businesses have created have been phenomenal. It's one of the most successful on a worldwide basis. It's quite, quite an interesting program. So it was that experience of one foot in government and one foot in entrepreneurship that I think was the reason they asked me to help create the policy or the strategy rather for the Tech City initiative which was launched by the Cameron administration say, on 10th of November uh, 2010. Now that this work is amazing and I would like just to um, probably just reflect on this work. And I think I know that a lot of governments are still discussing what is digital, what is tech nations, what is smart nations, all these different things. Yeah. When this, like you mentioned, was 10 years ago and they created this revolution that we have to, I think everyone listening to us have to realize that 10 years ago, London was known by being a financial hub and a bit of media hub. Besides that, there was probably not nothing. And especially, uh, it was not even on the top 20 countries with technology or stuff like that. So we're talking 10 years, London is leading all of that. So I would like, uh, from these 10 years, and I think you very humble the way you, you subscribed, but there's a massive amount of work that comprehend, of course, as well, the work of the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, or one of the former Prime Minister, David Cameron, and all his cabinet, and the Minister of, of Finance as well. But a bit of this context, because I think the devil's on details, and I think this work is something that I think should be a case study for other tech cities mm. around the world, and I think everyone should be learning with that. Yeah, it was fascinating. Well, first thing for me, it was the first time with direct access to central government policymaking. Uh, so it, although I was working with Department of National Trade, I was working to the special advisor team around the Prime Minister in number 10 Downing Street with meetings in and around 10 Downing Street two, three days a week. It was a unique time because what had happened was that the Cameron administration were looking for seeds of growth to see that they, if they could amplify through policy or advocacy in some way. And uh, they found that the tech sector in London in particular around the Old Street roundabout uh, was starting to just show interesting signs of growth. The area was always an interesting area for technology, but the location 
uh, as a tech destination hadn't been established by then. And what they did was they did a, various trade missions and uh, realized that actually they could create a strategy that was actually very ambitious. It really was a very ambitious strategy. It was something about East London potentially becoming something like Silicon Valley, potentially rivaling Silicon Valley. Talk about an audacious strategy that was you know, quite, quite difficult to execute, but I loved the boldness of it. You know, it really inspired me because I remember going to the event in the Truman Brewery just as an observer in the entrepreneur community for the launch of the Tech City Initiative and being so impressed that a government would focus so in so much detail on trying to create something bold, it really was quite inspiring. So when they asked me to, early the next year, uh, to actually write the strategy for the Tech City Initiative, uh, I knew exactly what to do because I have the personal experience of entrepreneurship. That's why my strategy was not something that you could ask a big consulting organization. Well, you could uh, ask them, but it was real hands-on experience of what entrepreneurs really needed. And so that was where the authenticity of the work that I did with number 10 uh, was in that literally it became a channel of feeding in people with ideas and, uh, for policy changes into the special advisor team at number 10 who would feed it into policy. And you, you saw something like five major policies changed in 18 months, in just under two years during that, those initial years. Um, and the, I would say that without a doubt, they transformed the whole of the United Kingdom as a destination of choice for tech companies in Europe. It really transformed everything. So, um, you know, policies around immigration, policies around uh, R&D. Um, the, the, probably one of the most important was figuring out how to unlock angel investing and the launch of the SEIS, the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, which seriously incentivized ordinary UK taxpayers to invest in early stage uh, risk technology companies and having the government share some of that risk, that was pioneering work that, you know, I was looking at the figures the other day, the amount and the volume of angel investment that flowed into literally thousands of companies since then has been as a direct result of that policy. Yeah, and, and I think after this, and, and well, congratulations, first of all, because I think... The well, I can't take the start. credit for it. I can take the credit for feeding into the policymakers. They had no, to actually you, go you, to the departments and do the policy, create the policies themselves. No, you are, it's always a teamwork, but you were the first CEO, so no one can take you that. And I think <laughs> you need as well to give some credit to where the credit is. So uh, after that, you created as well Level 49 that became as well one of Europe's most famous and largest hubs for fintech, cybersecurity, and smart cities technology companies. So can you tell us about that? So you start one and you went to the second. <laughs> well, actually, it was... I mean, I was only supposed to be with the tech, na tech city now, Tech Nation, of course. The, the organization has continued and is now responsible for Tech Nation. It's really quite special. Um, but I was only supposed to be there for about a year, but it was about 18 months in total because, of course, we had the Olympics during the time. And I wanted to use the Olympics as a very powerful magnet event to bring the brightest and the best into the UK. Um, we had some amazing events like uh, startup games. This was the brainchild of uh, somebody quite famous in the UK, you might know him, called Ollie Barrett. He came in, he fed into the number 10 Downing Street team this idea of startup games. And so we picked up that idea and ran with it and created this wonderful global competition for the brightest and the best startups to come and compete in, uh, in the technology equivalent, uh, like technology equivalent of the Olympics. It was wonderful to do things like that at that time. But towards the end of that period, I was sitting next to uh, Sir George Iacobescu. He's the chairman of the, he was the chairman and the chief executive at the time of the Canary Wharf Group. And he asked me this uh, question was to, you know, Canary Wharf Group is a, is a big real estate company. And he asked me this question about, could Canary Wharf ever become 
a genuine destination for tech companies. And I said, I don't know, let me come and have a look. And so I went to meet uh, Sir George and his team. Uh, and I loved their, even the boldness of their vision in getting Canary Wharf to be exactly what it was at that time. Yes, it had suffered considerably during the financial crisis, of course, with closures of people like Lehman Brothers, of course, you know, that was definitely impacting them. But I think what that also helped is that they were more willing to be bold and try a bolder strategy. And at the time, FinTech was just a nascent um, concept. And so what I suggested to them was that they actually helped me create, uh, and they, 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 they fully backed this concept to create the number one destination for FinTech companies anywhere in the world. And I suggested they provide the highest available complete floor of the biggest, tallest building in Canary Wharf, one Canada Square. So the four, all four sides. And it, as it happened, the highest available floor at the time was the 39th floor. Hence, level 39 was born. As you can see, we like to make decisions quickly. We got the branding done very quickly. Everybody knew where it was. <laughs> and that's why level 39 was created. And the real estate is an incredibly important part of it. But just as important as the real estate is the ecosystem. And you have to give Canary Wharf their credit because it's rare that a real estate company understands the power of both combined. Normally, real estate is about rents, tenants, yields, and returns, which is, of course, right for real estate companies. But actually, in this particular case, they backed the creation of what was, what is what, one of the most um, formidable and powerful and supportive uh, ecosystems for uh, you know, super growth anywhere in the world. And I'm very proud of that work uh, that, that has gone on to become as successful as it, as it has been. Of course, with COVID, all, e all such ecosystems are difficult, but we will see that one come back just as fast as it was created. No, and uh, congratulations for that. And as well, I know that, uh, again, now it seems normal. But uh, again, just just uh, at the time with like people were inventing fintech, I remember because I was part of it. And, and uh, even now people are discovering. So convincing a massive group that was a big part of London as well. And passing from one experience to the other is, is amazing. So I want to, my next question is, is, so one of the things that came out of both uh, London Tech City right now, smartnation.io, and the level 39 is that UK became the capital of unicorns in Europe with the biggest by far hub of unicorns and partly as well, uh, part of your results as well in your work. And uh, you're talking London that's generated more billion dollars companies than any country in the last years. Um, I'm talking especially in Europe, adding five recently, um, to a collection. I found 30 unicorns. Some of them might uh, be less unicorns now than others, but it's still quite an achievement, uh, uh, well, uh, a stunning number for all purpose. So I know that you were involved in a lot of these companies. Uh, some of them, you saw them from the beginning. Some of them probably were getting down and you had to give a bit of oxygen. So can you tell us a bit about this work and this touch as well about your focus in super growth and as well what you mentioned about the angel, the policies to to what nurture to create a billion dollars company? Because it's a company that, in the end of the day, can create a huge amount of wealth for a country and for taxes, for anything else, but as well IP and a lot of other different things. Absolutely, yeah. you're quite right. Um, so the the work that that we did was really focused around level 39 and a number of organisations that we encouraged to be created or actually created ourselves. One of them was Innovate Finance, the trade body for fintech, where we went with a policy paper to number 10 Downing Street on the opportunity for fintech and asked for their support to actually create this organization and to bring all the fintech entrepreneurs into number 10 to feed directly into the policy making uh, for fintech. And programs like the FCA's Project Innovate which is in itself has gone on to become one of the most famous uh, regulatory programs worldwide, uh, were born out of discussions like that. Um, and then 
Tech City itself went on to become Tech Nation and has these amazing, uh, you know, fast track accelerators for the rising stars and a concierge service for the future 50. Within those organizations and within Level 39 themselves, we helped create the optimum supporting environment in the UK to encourage super growth, but super growth that was hopefully a little more sustainable. But that's very difficult, as I say. It's not an easy thing to do, but it was definitely something that we experienced. My own personal experience, first-hand experience, is supporting companies like Revolut, who I remember when Nick and Vlad arrived in Level 39, it was them and a team of, I think, 15 at the time. Uh, and, you know, supporting their growth as they went through the challenges of that scale and speed of growth to five years later becoming a $5.2 billion valuation business and actually uh, an organization that looks like it is about to be, you know, on, on the road to becoming a very serious rival bank, you know, except it's a bank with 10x better performance than what you would normally expect. Um, those are the kind of super growth that we created the environment to support their growth. And this was around helping with talent, helping with space, helping with networks, helping with advisors, and actually bringing the concentrations of that so that it's readily available. I mean, we used to ring the cookie bell at three o'clock every day in level 39. Have you heard about the cookie bell? Yes. The cookie bell is so cool, right? We, we would bring warm cookies into the hub at three o'clock every day, roughly three o'clock. And people would gather, they would smell the cookies, we'd make it a bit late and people would hang out. So you'd see, you know, the team from Revolut and some of these other amazing companies there hanging out by the, the, the cookie bell, right? Waiting for the cookies to arrive, making connections, finding employees, finding advisors, you know, and, and finding opportunities, finding investors. Um, I, we called it orchestrating serendipity. So it doesn't feel like you're pushing it at any, anyone, but it's just naturally being imbibed. And what people feel that is if you create these ecosystems that allow you to naturally absorb the gaps that you have as, as a founder or as a team, you, you suddenly feel, gosh, I'm just more lucky here. But luck is a, a lot of it is about perspiration and a lot about preparation. So we did all of that. So they didn't have to, but created the optimum environment for them to succeed. Oh, that's amazing. And, and, uh, and I think, uh, like you mentioned, these ecosystems are more and more important because if you look at the success of Silicon Valley, and afterwards, New York, which have been the biggest uh, tech hubs in the world, they've been precisely because they have that ecosystem. Things don't happen by accident. There's always an ecosystem. There's always a community. Um, so after that, you left and you created the Frontier Network, uh, formerly C4DR. You were as well uh, the creator of ActiveLedger.io. And now, um, and Keybox as well. And now you are actually creating something quite uh, exciting, addonbase.com. Um, which is very is a baby right now. So I don't know. Tell us about that. I have a lot of questions and I'm particularly excited, but I would sure. like to hear about it. So as you know, we have quite good experience in creating very good ecosystems. But in all of the ecosystems in the past, I've never been allowed to invest in any companies or take any shares in them because either it was a government role or in the case of Canary Wharf, it was because it was for a real estate company. So what we decided to do is, my partner and I have uh, created this concept of Eden Base, which is a bit like Level 39, but with a fund. So it is designed to create uh, a, a community and an ecosystem. And as you know, that takes real effort to do. And then on top of that, to have a fund to invest in super growth companies and we're launching all of it right now with our competition our first investment competition uh, we're looking for two specific types of company uh, the first company type is we want companies that have a solution but are not yet using ai or machine learning or blockchain and then we want to look at that company and see whether we can invest in it and improve its performance through the implementation of AI or 
machine learning or blockchain or technologies, you know, frontier technologies. Uh, so, so that's one type of company. And the other type of company we're looking for, and we might fast track some investments, is we're looking for uh, COVID beating solutions. So companies that have technology that can beat COVID, that can make travel safer, you know, commuting, travel, aeroplanes, cars, anything, buses, or places safer. So offices, meeting rooms, cinemas, hospitals, care homes, any, any company that has technology like that to be COVID beating, because we believe that COVID has taught us we must improve our game in how we create spaces and transport that is much safer for society. And so, uh, you know, even if we manage, as we manage to beat COVID with a vaccine, of course, it'll evolve, there may be others. And so these kind of technologies are going to be long term, extremely valuable. Amazing. And I think uh, that there's, uh, well, there's a lot of work to be done there, because of course, uh, I don't think things are going to get back to normal. Um, and I think there will be a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges that I think especially this challenge can actually help a lot. So one of the things that uh, you are particularly focused on Eden Base is creating communities and super growth. So Correct. how do you define this, especially someone that has been creating two of the biggest tech ecosystems in the world, but as well that as right now, like you mentioned, uh, more uh, investment side, whereas in the other ones, you are a corporate slash uh, policy making and director side. You, you ask a great question. You know more than anyone else that it is very difficult to create a true ecosystem and community that is actually supportive. And there are two methods that are behind this. One of them is from my partner, Daniel Dahl Steinberg. His philosophy is about challenging and sharing knowledge. Right? It's a very interesting philosophy because um, the, the most supportive ecosystem shares knowledge, but it also challenges them. Because it's when you challenge your knowledge or your preconceived ideas, that's when discovery takes place. So that's a very high level way of explaining a very detailed thesis that, he, that he's created. I mean, he's created, um, designed some of the most amazing uh, projects like the Atari token project, which independently people were saying is one of the world's first potential trillion dollar uh, ecosystem projects, right? It's really interesting, the Atari project. So those kind of ecosystems uh, are part of what, what we're building, coupled with, combined with everything that we learned with Tech City, Tech Nation, and Level 39 in creating that the, in, in orchestrating the serendipity by anticipating the needs of your companies as they grow and having the trusted sources and marketplace available. So what that will look like in the hub is we will invest in, say, 30, 40% of the businesses in the hub. But what we will want is other businesses to be in the hub that are the ecosystem that support the growth of these companies. And so we've designed this to be um, purposely encouraging their super growth in a way that is sustainable and actually not just sustainable, means that the companies that we support will have a positive impact on the world that we that they're you know providing their products and services to amazing i'm looking forward to see it i think especially this area because of your experience i think um, it's the most important thing because i think we like you mentioned even in your own is experience of working with multiple companies the the timeline of a company is smaller and smaller with some exceptions um, and as well, uh, we're going to be facing, especially like you mentioned with the AI and blockchain, uh, the exponential growth that you can see that we never saw in history can be taken to a completely different direction. So you mentioned sustainability and sustainable companies. So one of the things that I know that you focus on this new venture is ESG investing. Yes. So can you tell us about how do you see ESG investment for the people that never heard about it, but especially the ways you are nurturing this with your new venture? You know, the, one of the best things about this is that I was not aware of the of ESGs until actually just a few years ago. And I learned about it from uh, one of the startups in the hub in, uh, in Frontier Network. And every day, it became a percolation of awareness that something that really 
you embrace as a holistic way of existing, which is you are operating all your normal processes and business processes, but there is this additional lens which is not laid on top. It becomes fundamental, becomes systemic, which is ESG. And what does it stand for? Okay, it's environment, sustainability, and governance. It is the, if you like, three measures by which major corporations, as well as smaller businesses, will be measured, because a lot of it is business-related impact. But what's interesting is that the stakeholders who will decide whether someone has met their ESG compliance are the investors or the asset management world that are investing in, say, listed companies. And listed companies will have to present validated, attested credentials, ESG credentials. There's new regulation coming out called SFDR regulation, which enshrines this in law. In, um, in, for example, in Europe, you'll see SFDR regulation becoming more and more implemented. But the asset management industry uh, will not be able to buy products unless they understand their ESG credentials of, say, the underlying companies. So what does it mean? Well, it means that, for example, a, a, a car company will have to prove what kind of energy they're using in manufacturing. Is it energy that's created sustainably? And being able to prove that so that true authenticity of sustainability in energy uh, is just one aspect of it. Uh, you know, there's so many other aspects, including social, uh, diversity, inclusion, um, but a lot of it is around uh, ensuring that we are really embracing as a society the ethical custodianship of, the, of our future, which we've kind of ignored. You know, this is the future is profit with a purpose. And I won't say that we've always had the right approach to that in the past. So for me, this has been something that I give the credit to one of our companies to actually making me aware of it initially. And then by, you know, the, the visits to and the learnings from places like Davos helped me understand that even further. But it's very hard to implement. You know, we actually need technologies like blockchain to help us with the immutability of such uh, platforms. And, um, you know, I'm involved in a project now, uh, Active Ledger, where I'm chairman, is involved in a project that is creating an, an ESG attestation platform. Why are, we, why are we doing that? Because one of the biggest investors in the world asked us to, you know, is it possible that blockchain can enable this? And so it's also market driven. Finally, I would say that ultimately, it will be the consumer and society that demands this. Um, so the trusted brands of the future will be the ones who totally embrace uh, ESGs and sustainability uh, throughout their core. Not as, for example, uh, a nominated person, uh, you know, as part of their CSR strategy, but as a core board member where every single board member has the responsibility to ensure ESGs are met. It's a life, it's a world changing uh, thing, but it's very difficult to do. Um, but I think the timing is right because now we have the benefit of, I can only describe it as superpower technology that enables us to do things that we could never previously consider. I'm completely, and I think this is a key element for society at large. So I have one question related with this, because like you mentioned, this is something difficult and super um, sensitive, especially because it touches, yes. um, well, it touches policy making, it touches ethics, and as well, especially, how do you see this in the relationship? So uh, if I, I want to go a bit more philosophical now, okay, I, go think, for uh, <laughs> I will go to the, the other things, but so... You mentioned AI and blockchain, and as we see, these are by far the most disruptive technology in the history of mankind. If you put it together with 4AR and all the different areas of technology are going to be even more tricky. But someone that has been behind billion dollars companies, and mostly in policy making, and as well seeing them growing. So these companies have a big responsibility, but as well, um, at the moment, a massive power. And how do you see these, especially the power that comes with AI and, and blockchain, because most of the um, including your partner and other people, I've been talking about singularity and all these different things. So we're going to have 
the next 10, 20 years, something that no one knows exactly because you can create already superhumans, you can do all of these things, but you still have a lot of issues in the world. So there's ESG in one, in one end, and there's all the reality, and then there's all the technology that's not going to stop to anything. So how do you see these things, especially when it comes to super growth, ESG, and what are you trying to do in terms of your ventures and uh, this specifically Eden Bay's project? Yeah, so how we are going to approach this is by assuming that we know nothing and actually starting again and learning from the beginning everything that we need to learn from the best people that we can find to help us understand what that means. We know what it feels like. We know what our goal is. At the end of this, I want us to have unicorns, decacorns um, that are just wonderful businesses that contribute to society really positively that we can be so proud of. You know, I want my grandchildren to say, oh, granddad, did you do, do that, right? And I want to be able to say yes. I can't say that at the moment, so I've got a lot of work to do. So, so that's the measure. How do we get there? What's the journey? The truth is we don't know yet. And what I also believe is that people, if I may respectfully say of my age, are probably not as well equipped to understand what this means. I wasn't raised at school where they taught me what ML was, right? And so I, don't, I didn't understand what the power of AI was when I was growing up as a child. We need, without doubt, education to be massively upgraded so that the ability of the much younger people to understand the impact of these kind of technologies will enable the ethical custodianship of these technologies for society in the future. Regrettably, Dinesh, it's not you and me, but it's our children and our grandchildren, who, if we help them with the right education and learning now, will be in a much better place to understand the impact of, as I call it, the ethical custodianship of the impact of these technologies. Well, I think it's more us for now, <laughs> because I think, I think still one of the things that I'm seeing is the velocity, the velocity, and you mentioned super growth, the velocity is so far if you look what happened last week with DeepMind, that uh, just entirely, well, let's see, it's still blah, 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 but I hope it's a bit more real, but they supposedly uh, solve one of the biggest problems in, in human <laughs> ecosystem. So we're going to see a lot of things happening very disruptive, and I think that's what a lot of people, but well, I, I'm not going, that is probably another interview. So uh, in terms of- um, But let me uh, ask you something though. I'm gonna yeah, ask no, no. you a question, because it's a great, it's a great, it's a great, philosophical question and you wanted to do that right now today would you get in a driverless car and say take me here i think in some context yes okay in some context yes so mentally you have accepted because you're a technocrat right you yes. really are a leading expert in this so you understand what lidar is you understand the big data you understand you've got a grasp of how the technology could be better at driving than humans in that it shouldn't have a lapse, right? It shouldn't, exactly. it won't nod off at the wheel. So, so you understand that. What about pilotless airplanes? Would you get on one of those? Well, actually, the irony is that I think probably 50% of the, the pilot work is already automated. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we are already there. So I think it's, it's the point okay, is that- Okay, good. It, yeah. What about surgery without a surgeon? That is probably a bit more sensitive, but still, I think uh, probably yes, because I, I, for instance, just an example from my research, what I've been seeing is that the, the biggest challenge with healthcare is that, uh, <laughs> this is a big discussion, but the healthcare part right now is completely fragmented. Yeah. And yeah. most of the work that, if I go to a doctor in my GP here in London, and then if I go to, to, to a second one, they, their database is not speaking with each other. So in the end of the day, if I'm lucky and I find a doctor that is a bit more data centric, it probably will do a bit of inception in terms of my data. Otherwise, yeah. it will be probably a waste of time. So I think we, I would say that the machines are actually acting better than us. I think it's the way we're managing them. And all the, or the way, like you mentioned, the, the challenge right now is that everyone is using a phone that has all the technology possible, but no one is coordinating all these different things. And it comes to education and special to entrepreneurs like us. And I think you're still yeah, very young. <laughs> so we cannot put this in our children because they, I think the spe five years in AI and technology is like 50 years or even 100 years or more. So, oh. so I think right now 
this is much faster. Very well, it's a longer one. Do you know what? I'd love to. You and I should have a real in-depth debate on this one day because it's a fascinating topic. And I think you would be a very good person to debate this through with because I don't know the answer yet, but I want the debate. No, no, but I think that's why these interviews, I, I think you mentioned mm. the fact that you are working in super growth. Is that, for instance, at the moment, uh, there's a couple of hedge funds <laughs> managing billions of dollars with four or five people. And this, in the past, you would have to have like 100,000 people or even 200, half a million people to reach this. So we are disrupting the entire world economy with yeah. three, four people in front of an hedge fund or stuff like that. So this is happening in a lot of different ways. It's true. Technology for, for but for us, the reason that we resulted upon this concept of super growth with a positive impact is partly because of COVID. Uh, we have lost so much value in, on a global basis. Uh, employment is going to be massively impacted by this, let alone the tragedy of the deaths in society, that actually we really are going to have to you know, double down on super growth. Any nation seeking to emerge from this in a way that uh, accelerates the return to, you know, stability, society, taxes, normality, is going to have to really focus on things like super growth, but the ethical custodianship of that. Okay, that's the important. That's why we call it sustainable super growth, because it's both and it should endure beyond us. No, and I think that is the most important thing that I think we all need to do. So, so this gives me, brings me to the next question, and I'll try to wrap up in a while, because it's just sure. already one hour. But So the next one is precisely, so I had this question here. So COVID-19 in one end, like you said, was a, has been a, a massive destruction of the economy, economics and financials. But at the same time, if you make a comparison, for instance, the last big epidemic we had was in 1920. And at the time, 200 million people died, and the effects for the world economy was massive. But one thing from a data perspective is that at the time, the world population was around 1.5 billion people. I don't think even 2 billion. Now we have eight and the number of deaths. So that means in the space of 100 years, we not only diminish the number of deaths, but we prepare ourselves. And still we have the world economy running with all of this. But the COVID-19 is an accelerator of digital transformation and technology. So a lot of the things you've been doing with Level 49 and all your previous ventures, are right now being accelerated times X, whatever. So yeah. how do you see this, especially, and you are looking as well to solutions to come up with an, adapting this to create a new normal with your new venture, but how do you see this as a redesign? Because you redesigned partly the UK tech landscape. Um, you are, of course, the people that work with you. And um, how can we do that right now with COVID-19? Because it's a great opportunity, first of all, to to empower these organizations, but as well, one big challenge that, I, and I think I'll put that to make the question more complex, but you know me. So it's the point is that at the moment, all this technology is owned by Silicon Valley still. Okay? Even all the unicorns that we created here in London, none of them has the power of, uh, um, well, the likes of Google, Facebook, or Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple, and of course, some of the Chinese ones that, yes, those ones are right now starting to have the same power. But how do you see this? Because this is, for me, the biggest challenge of a lifetime, especially our yeah. lifetime and our children. And, uh, and as well, how can we make these bridges? So I think the way or the pathway to uh, the kind of future that you and I are thinking about is achieved by not overly protecting the past. Okay, it's, it's an interesting concept to grasp. Um, when you think about protecting legacy. Uh, if the legacy has been partly destroyed due to COVID, well, the behavioral scientists will tell you that's the time that you can get the most rapid acceleration of technology helping to solve some of society's real problems like health, like hunger. You mentioned DeepMind. What a wonderful idea. I hope it is all the things that you, you, you know, that everybody is saying it, it, it's having solved some of the world's most fundamental problems. And I hope to see many, many more things like that. But in that we have used uh, the need to protect legacy in the past as a reason to go slower. I think that the nudge theorists of the future will look back at this time saying that society was allowed to go faster and to deploy technologies for humanity in a much more uh, effective way 
because of COVID. But I, I do think of one important aspect that we mustn't lose sight of, which are the ethics around this, because I think we've only just started to scratch the surface on what the ethics of, say, job displacement are like uh, about. And any government or society or ecosystem thinking about this needs to have an eye on that and put in place the resources to rapidly ensure reskilling. It's for me, the nation that invests most heavily on reskilling to be ready for the future is going to be one of the winners. It's one of the key ingredients out there. So I'd suggest that uh, it's, it comes back, as you and I have spoken about occasionally, that education and a commitment to the holistic resources needed. The investment must be, the ecosystem must be there, the hubs must be there, the experts must be there, and the long-term capital to ensure sustainable investment through all growth phases that will ensure the right amount of change uh, in the right way for the future we are now facing fourth industrial revolution for ar and we are also um we have the other vision that is from the japanese government a human-centric society 5.0 and all the areas of digital transformation so as someone that has been behind the startups behind business behind policy for co for governments how do you see the future of startups and business and specifically the main trends that you want to highlight? And I think this specifically after you touch the automation, the ethics, the education, but as well mm. in the pragmatic world, because I think this is important for people, especially you, you have an experience yeah. of dealing with hundreds of companies as well. I, I think that you will still see thousands and thousands of companies solving very simple problems. And they will be extremely valuable. They employ thousands of people. They all contribute to various economies and they will make things work better. We have better products and services. And, and so you'll still see that. But what I think is uh, likely to happen for uh, some startups is that the focus on creating from, st from, the, from the start uh, new products, new markets that didn't exist before. That's why I'm quite in awe of my, you know, my business partner. He's one of the few people that I've met that has created a business model for an entire new economy to exist in the metaverse, if you like, in a way that we can't imagine now. And so you, there will be wealthy people, millionaires, prosperity created in the metaverse that we can't imagine yet and that he was one of the first people to conceive of this in a way that an analyst said, an investing analyst said that that could be a real trillion dollar opportunity. Of course, it was leveraged by a terrific brand, the Atari brand, which has great gaming credentials. But it's how you see things like games evolving in the fourth industrial revolution. And there are even hints as to how, well, actually even things like basic universal income could be propagated through platforms like that. But that's a whole different conference and thought leadership piece of work that actually, you, you should be leading that. You are exactly the right person to lead that, that kind of thinking and provoke the thinking that's needed as we imagine what these kind of solutions are gonna be needed in society, what they will be like. Uh, I hope to work on that with Eden Base because I think it's important uh, that we work together collaboratively. So my last question, and I'm really uh, excited, I probably went up more like two hours, but we'll do probably part two and part three. But I think the, the last one, so you have a high achievement career. Um, you've been, uh, like you mentioned, you have the challenge, but you have as well fantastic achievements. Um, so I think one of the things that I've been finding out is the, the little details, so the things that make a big difference for the life of a startup, an entrepreneur, a business leader, or sometimes even a government trying to create great stuff. So any tips, any things for people listening to us, any things that you would like to highlight from your failures or success? So that, many, yeah. so many. I, I tell you what, there is one I would recommend for founders. Find an advisor that will give you the advice for free because they care about you and you don't give them any shares, you don't pay them any money, that they're only giving you the advice because they want to see you do better, succeed. There should be no financial incentive in that relationship whatsoever, no shares, no, no equity. If you can find someone like that, then 
you will genuinely receive, in theory, more balanced view that cares about you and your family. Uh, I made the mistake of wanting to give everybody that was involved in helping a piece of the action. And I realized much too late that skewed even their view viewpoint. So that, that's just a little tip that I give you. Sorry, that leads me to another question. How can you do that? <laughs> ah, that's a, that is, I, I, I think it's a very good tip. I, I completely yeah. am with you. It is a precious the, one. Yeah. Find, the, find a fantastic ecosystem where the creators of that ecosystem understand that's what's needed and make that available to you. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah. So, Eric, I, I appreciate it's been one hour and a half. So I think I, well, I have a lot of more questions, but I think I want to keep this one. So just, um, I think I don't know if you want to highlight about Eden Bays. We're going to put all the links and different things. Well, thank you. you are, but I think just to, for people that uh, wanted to know more and uh, just as a... Well, reference. right now, I mean, I know, what your, I know what your videos are like. They endure for generations. But, so for right now, though, at this time, we are very keen for companies that are... AI curious, frontier, and, you know, frontier technology curious, wondering what it can do for their businesses or their applications. We want them to apply because we want to invest in these companies. Not only do we want to invest in them, we want to help them with the right expertise to manage the technology transformation. So please apply, edenbase.com, you'll find the competition. And also, um, the other thing is if you have any COVID beating solutions that you want us to try, we are willing to test these in our own hub to make them as COVID safe as possible. Please get in touch also via the competition or edenbase.com. There's a lot of uh, wisdom here. I hope everyone finds it as I find it. And once again, very grateful to have you here, Eric. Thank you, Dinesh, and your team.